Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Going to do Passover today. Um, we'll be taking communion before this hour is finished. What, what, what is Passover? What does it signify? Well, it is. It has been replaced by a pagan word, Ishtar, Ishtar, basically. You see, there's only one place in the King James that Easter is mentioned in the book of Acts. But take your Strong's Concordance or any set of manuscripts, and you will see that the word is not Easter. That was a pagan goddess, Ishtar. Um, and Greek mythology and uh, um, a, a pagan holiday that fell about the same time as Passover. And ministers have always wanted to enlarge their crowds. And it, uh, I, I don't know how they couldn't be particular. I wouldn't want anyone but a true Christian in my congregation. That is to say, unless it was someone that was seeking. Now, uh, so what is our Passover? I want to make it very clear. I want you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's find out that Passover, which originated in the Old Testament when our people were freed from Egypt, that a lamb was slain. And that lamb's blood was placed upon the doorpost, a smear. And this prevented the death angel from coming in upon the family. And it, that was our school teacher, our schoolmaster, for what Passover still signifies to this day. Because there was another lamb slain, and he became our Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, let's pick it up if we may with verse 7, and it reads, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that's old traditions, old thought, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, and even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. What is our Passover, and who was it sacrificed for us? Why? Because he, he was crucified perfect as an offering for one and all times, as it is written and emphasized in the 10th chapter of the great book of Hebrews. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, to be the offering for one and all times, never again, the blood of goats and bulls and so forth, but the blood of Christ uh, that um, sacrificed for us, that the old death angel must always pass over your house, that is to say, your people, uh, for anything that does not apply to God's word. Verse 8 to continue. Therefore, let us keep the feast, that's the high Sabbath, Passover, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's the unleavened bread that is his body, and the cup, which is his blood that was shed for us, that sacrificed for one and all times, that on believing upon him, that you have forgiveness, not for some of your sins, all of your sins. This is what is so beautiful about Passover, and it is the Passover that should be taught to young people, not traditions of paganism that have worked in. And the, you know what's really sad? Most Christians are not even aware that it's paganism. They think it's a really uh, a church. Instead of, instead of Passover being the time that we celebrate for one and all times the sacrifice of all sacrifices, Jesus Christ, instead of quick like bunnies, a sexual orgy, and rolling Easter eggs, which is the uh, sign of fertility in the grove, straight out of the woods, a spring uh, festival, to have little children replacing that, to replace our true Passover, the sacrifice for one and all times, 
Jesus Christ who was sacrificed for us. You know, in the crucifixion, he left us a message. It's a message you should never forget. And it is this season, this Passover time, that this message should always come forth. It is the fact of that even on the cross, he taught us. He taught us how to do things with dignity. And certainly, he paid that price with dignity for one and all times. Now, before he began this teaching, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 27, and we'll go to the uh, crucifixion and watch the words very carefully of what was said there, because only God himself could arrange things as they were arranged, um, and uh, the schoolmaster, a thousand years before the fact, gave us the true teaching. Matthew chapter 27, let's pick it up with verse 41. He's on the cross, and um, uh, the um, and we'll just pick it up there. Likewise also, Matthew 27, verse 41. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, mark these words well, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, and you will note it's the full title here, let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe him. Do you think they really would have? No, they wouldn't have. Absolutely not. Why? They're mockings. Verse 43. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now, what you want to remember is if you're not attuned with God's plan, to understand what our Father is doing here, you would have to reverse time all the way back to the time that Abraham was ordered by Almighty God to take his only son up Mount Moriah, which is very near the place Christ was crucified. And to lift the knife and take his own son's life as a sacrifice. And just as he was about, just as Abraham was about to bring the knife down, God stopped him. And there was a lamb in a bush caught, and it became the sacrifice at that time. Well, at this time, God himself is delivering up his only begotten son as a sacrifice for all his children that believe upon him. So naturally, God's not going to bring him down from the cross because it is God's plan, as it is well written, and we'll document here in a moment, a thousand years before the fact that it would happen exactly this way. But mark those words, he trusted in God. They were written a thousand years before. Verse 44. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same uh, in his teeth. And in verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That is on our time from 12 noon till 3 p.m. I mean, it turned dark, black. You would have thought somebody might get a little suspicious that this was not a natural event. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And here we have that fact. This is, naturally, it's, it is not the English tongue, but it is Aramaic. It is um, um, the tongue of our ancestors. What is he saying? Number one, Jesus never called our Father God. He always called him Father. So what is Jesus doing here? He's quoting Scripture. 
word for word. And he wants you to be well aware of that. As he was nailed to that cross and as that darkness left at 3 p.m. and light came upon the world, that light from the cross still taught in the transition of paying the price for us when that lightness came at 3 p.m. The same time that the veil would be rent from top to bottom, opening the Holy of Holies to whomsoever will. He brought this message, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And naturally, he's quoting the 22nd Psalm, which was written a thousand years before the fact. Turn there with me, if you would. And this is what he wanted you to know. This is what he was talking about. This is what he wanted you to be well aware of. And... Um, uh, his words, and you will also hear the words of the high priest who was simply a fake, documenting and showing you that God has total control, that God uses whomever he will. Chapter 22, Psalms 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? This was David's psalm, and Christ is repeating it so that you understand the prophecy, David was a prophet, as it's written in Acts chapter 2, whereby you would know the very words of Christ on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Drawing your attention to this, that is to say, if you're familiar with God's word, okay, so that you would know and understand and you would not mislead people by bringing paganism into the high Sabbath of Christianity. It's a very serious thing. Verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season and am not silent. I, I, I can't get any rest, David said. Verse 3, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. And our people always have loved our Father. Verse, uh, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted in God. Didn't just deliver them always. Our Father will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And many people that forsake him then turn around and say, well, he forsook me. Oh, no, he didn't. You forsook him. You left him. Because God would never leave you. That's his promise. Verse 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. That's to say they weren't disgraced. Verse 6. But I am a worm. David feeling very down. And no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. And this is why Christ picked this up. All, all the healings, all the miracles, feeding of the people in the desert, ceasing the, uh, have, causing the storm to cease, all those miracles, Lazarus from the dead, he's treated like this. You know, and, and that shows you this world that we live in. There's nothing new under the sun. People rise to power that uh, is, it's interesting to watch them. Some will have compassion and some are just no good, period. Verse 7, and they see me laugh, uh, all that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, listen carefully, I ask you to remember these words from Matthew chapter uh, 27. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And of course, that's uh, repeating Psalm of Matthew 27, 46. What, what a shame that some people are so blind to the very teachings. Many might say, well, well how do we know that? Well, uh, how, what does it take to make a believer out of you? It was written a thousand years before those words came forth. Not from Christ. 
Those words came forth from the, the high priest, which was not even a Christian, which was not even of Israel, basically, but appointed by a Roman general as a religious man. Verse 9, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. And Christ's words begin to take over. And so that you know these words do apply to Christ. And I, I do not feel that he spoke part of this psalm on the cross. I think he spoke every word of it. And I'll document that before we finish this lecture. Verse 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. He was the only begotten. Verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. They had all forsaken him. I do have to say that there was a small group of women on a hill close by. And, um, and I would have to defend the disciple he loved because Christ sent him away with Mary. Verse 12, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. In other words, Bashan, Basin was known for huge uh, bulls of uh, power, of strength. And he says, my enemy is all around me. And, and you could hardly make a dent in their will. Naturally, they were crying out at the feet of, foot of, before the fact, crucify him. Even with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, trying to petition for him. Verse 13, they gapped upon me with their mouths as a raving and roaring lion. They were against me one and all. And um, it, was, it was not a, a good moment. But perhaps we can see the best picture that you could ever wish to see of the people at the foot of the cross and, and surrounding, on the road going by, even what they would be saying shooting out their lip. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. It's melted my very heart within me. Why, why would he say that his bones were pulled from joint? He was crucified. He was nailed to that cross, and on hanging there these many hours, his arms were pulled from socket. Uh, and let's go with the next verse. Verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My mouth is dry. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Dust means the end of the day. It's coming. It's very near. And of course, at all this time, he knows that he is paying this price for us. That's why it is so precious, beloved. Many might say, well, I just don't think Jesus suffered any pain on that cross. Oh, then you've never read his report. How, how do you think that having your arms jerked from socket and your tongue cleaving to the sides of your mouth. Do you know what a potsherd is? That's an old piece of broken pottery in a desert land. Dry, uh, then uh, I can think of some terminology we call dry now, but I won't use it. Uh, I, how you could think that would not be painful. He did it for you. Well, why would he do that? Because he loves you. He cares. I don't care what other people have done to you. I don't care how lonely you may feel at times. He loves you. And when one that is perfect gives his life so that others may live, that's love, my friend. Verse 16. For dogs have compassed me about. That translated enemies. My enemies are surrounding me. 
The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They nailed him to that cross. What a perfect report and what a perfect teaching that he would do upon that cross when he began uh, even speaking in the native tongue. Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene. For you, letting you know. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. And they did as he was crucified, as he hung there. There were many that had, you know, multitudes followed him at one time or the other. And many of those had to be scattered around and there had to be a lot of wondering going on in their minds that he spoke as such a leader and look at him. He, he does not have power over the enemy, you know. Yes, he did. You see, in this crucifixion, Satan brought about his own death call. For when he brought about the crucifixion of the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, God doesn't have to worry about marching Satan into the lake. He asked for it, and boy, is he going to get it. I'll document that in a moment. I hadn't planned to, but I will. I'll document it. Next verse, verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my best stuff. Now, how possibly could someone have known a thousand years before the fact that the Roman soldiers would be gambling for his robe? How could they have? Well, it's just, it's just a, a coincidence. No, it isn't. It is written. And it came to pass exactly as it was written, every detail around that cross. He was doing that for you. And that royal robe that they were gambling for, they would never possess because that robe of royalty was for the king of kings and the lord of lords. And even though they had power to manipulate, they were mocked a thousand years before when this was written that men would be so foolish that they would do this. And there they were, gambling casting lots for his, his robe. And uh, no man can take that from him. There is only one king of kings and there is only one lord of lords. And regardless of how man or some judge or somebody else might wish that they had the authority to take that power from him or anything from him or anything from any of his, forget it. Because there's only one King of Kings. There's only one Lord of Lords. And our Heavenly Father brought forth that only begotten that would pay for our sins when we believe, repenting, and loving him in return, accepting the gift of life. I'm talking about eternal life. But it is amazing that a thousand years before even this could come to pass. Let's go with the next uh, verse, verse 19. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Um, uh, has thee to help me. Uh, and, and he always will, okay? Verse 20, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling. This word darling is the same word as soul, so I'll translate it soul. My soul from the power of the dogs, my enemies. And God will always do that. This is why prayer is so important, beloved. There are no accidents when it comes to the word of our Heavenly Father. He is in charge, and that crucifixion went down exactly as it is written. Every detail, exactly 
as he had requested. Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Uh, this word unicorns is wild ox, okay? Don't just scratch unicorn out. It's, it's an, that's mythology in itself, and it doesn't exist in the manuscripts. Verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. It's very important that you know that verse. It should sound familiar to you. Because do you understand that within that verse we just read, you have the very in-depth reason that Christ even came to this world and why he did as he did, and you will find it in Hebrews. Now, you're not going to have it on the character generator, but I'm going to turn there anyway, Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to spend just a moment understanding what is to be done with the congregation, the whole congregation. Hebrews chapter 2, and... Uh, here, you will have the reason Christ came to this earth. Verse 12 reads, And I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise to him. That's Psalms 22, 22. That's it. In the midst of the congregation is the church. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me going to do it. 14, here's the reason. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise, that's Christ himself, took part of the same, that through death, that is to say through his crucifixion, which we're reading of in Psalms 22, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That's what it's all about, is the fact that even though Satan himself, the cherubim, was created by Almighty God, which is a, a child of God. And it takes a lot to kill one of your own children. And God has that to do. And this is one of the reasons that there will be no problem with sentencing Satan as to where he belongs and where he was long ago. That God didn't send you here to experience life in flesh. Oh, it is so hard, some would say. Not nearly as hard as it was for the Savior whom they crucified. With all his good works, they crucified him. Many people say, well, I'd just like to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Some of you couldn't handle it. Okay. Verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on a flesh body, Emmanuel, born of woman, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make what? To, what was the reason? To make reconciliation for the sins of the people, yours. He did it for you. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure, guarantee them that are tempted. He can, he, can, he can secure them. He can anchor them. He can give them something to go for. So you see, even this word of declaring among the congregation, the fact that it was written a thousand years before the crucifixion, exactly what would transpire on that day, and most of all, the reason thereof for our salvation. And to rid this world, ultimately, of Satan, 
for one and all times. He came to this earth. He died on the cross whereby he could destroy the devil, death, which is to say the devil. There's no great secret in that. And then we can begin to understand why in Psalms 22 it is so written and so it came to pass that the Romans would be gambling for his clothing. That his arms would be pulled from socket, but not broken. That his mouth would be dry as a pot shirt. Exactly as it went down. And yet he brought this forth to you, word for word, teaching from that cross, even as he was accomplishing this great gift to men, the destruction of Satan, the bringing in of salvation, the washing away of our terrible sins, that he brings forth truth, protection, comfort, and allows us to understand truth. Or can you not see why this is a high Sabbath of Christianity? Do you believe the word of God where it is written, Christ is our Passover? His body, the bread, his blood that brings by, by the remission of sins, forgiveness. Our Passover, and it is something everyone must remember and to know. We're going to be taking communion very soon. So we're going to take a break, and this will give you an opportunity to go get the ingredients to participate in taking this Holy Communion in this season, in this time of Passover, the high Sabbath day of Christianity, that time when he paid the price and we received the healing, we received the blessings, we received the freedom, that spirit of freedom that we know we're free from the shackles of this world in a bondage that brings destruction at the hand of Satan. Because when you have that mark of Christ, the Passover, on your doorpost, you go back to the old schoolmaster and bring it forward and understand. The death angel must pass over you. Can't he harm you, can't have anything to do with you. Why? Because God has given us power over all of our enemies. All right, bless your heart. You get the ingredients and listen just a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's continue in Psalms 22, where we had just covered verse 22, which means, which stated, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation while I praise thee. Always declare Christ's name. Well, what is Christ's name? It's Christos. It is Yeshua. What does it mean? It means Yahweh, 
That's our Father's Savior. That's where our salvation comes from. Don't ever forget it. And that's why you declare him, because you want your friends, your brethren, to have that salvation, that freedom of knowing and understanding. Continuing with verse 23 in Psalms 22. Ye that fear the Lord, that's to say that you revere him, you love him, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. And that is to say all that would believe upon that name, whomsoever will. Verse 24. He hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. And that works the same for you, beloved. Every time you cry out to Almighty God, he hears you. Uh, you might say, well, why would he listen to little old me? You're his child. Do you not listen to your children? Naturally. God loves his children. And when you, when you pray to him, or just talk to him, when you cry out to him, and he will hear you. Uh, he is very aware of any affliction that might be brought upon you or for, that you must bear. And don't worry. He is a jealous God. I'll, I'll just put it this way. He doesn't appreciate people picking on his kids at all. And to prove that love is this very chapter itself for what he did for us, Emmanuel, God with us, on that cross. And back in Hebrews chapter 2, stating he could have come in the supernatural if he had wanted to. But no, he came just as we are, in the flesh, to show us that he could cut it. He could get it done. Verse 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I may pay my vows before them that fear him. Those that love him can understand this. We can share it with them, and they will know and understand. 26, the meek, that's to say the humble, shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Your, that is to say your mind, your soul, your intellect shall live forever. Why? You will have eternal life that believe upon him. You know, serving God is not a part-time thing. It's forever. Forever. Verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. You know, that is kind of, in a way, it's a little bit sad, but we're talking about the first day of the millennium. Every knee is going to bow before him. Now, I wish I could say they would all be sincere. But I cannot say or nor report that they would all be sincere. They are at the moment. But I also know what happens on the last day of the millennium. That many go into the lake of fire, which is known as the second death, a Revelation chapter 20, last verses. Because they still follow Satan. Can't get it straight. Poor losers. Don't ever be a loser. And at the ends of the world, be in the right place. And no, and worship him genuinely, that is to say sincerely and in truth. Knowing what he has done for you, how could you be otherwise? Verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's. There's no question about that, okay? It's not up for grabs. And he is the governor among the nations. It wouldn't do anyone to gamble for that, wish for it, grasp at it, war over it. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He always will be. 
the sooner people realize that, the sooner even nations realize that, the sooner they might find some peace in this world, for he is the prince of peace. Verse 29. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. You cannot in any way whatsoever work out your own salvation through cloning, through building a tower of Babel to find your ladder to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, that is to say, to be with God, and that is to be with Him and in Him. There are no shortcuts. And I suppose in a way He's giving us a hint at why many of them that bow before Christ on that first day of the millennium will go into the lake of fire with Satan on the last day because they weren't really sincere. They did not wish to believe. I, I, I find that, that is really something I wrestle with. I have very great difficulty in understanding after someone had seen Christ face to face, had heard him teach for a thousand years and his servants, could still be deceived by a con artist that is a dead man walking. For you see, that's what Satan is. He's a dead man walking. But you certainly do have people that will continue to be deceived, listening to that that is carnal, even though they would be in a spiritual body. That's, that's what really is the hooker that makes it so difficult to understand how someone could be raised into a spiritual body in the millennium and see the marvelous works that Christ has laid before us through the seven trumps, the seven seals, the seven vials, all these things coming to pass, playing out before us, that we would still have doubt believing upon him. I, that is a very difficult thing to understand, but it will be so. For it is written, they shall come again against the Lord Jesus Christ on that last day, even though on the first day they bowed to him. Let's go to the next verse, if we may, verse 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. This is why you can say that the Lord Jesus Christ was thinking of you on that day. Because what generation is he talking about? He's talking about the generation of the fig tree. He's talking about that generation. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. That generation that would witness against that false teaching. That would witness against the false Christ. That would lead people when the whole world goes whoring after false teachings, there would be that handful that would be accounted to him as a generation, his generation, that would love him, would appreciate him, that would follow him. What a beautiful time that we live in. And that day is approaching that that generation will be called for the generation of the fig tree. Christ taught us of that fig tree generation in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, when he said, before that generation passes away, all the words of God's book should be completed, should be fulfilled, the prophecies pertaining to the return of Christ. Verse 31 to complete, Psalms 22. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born umbilical cord to umbilical cord many generations away. We're talking about now that he hath done this. 
Now, I stated that I would document that he taught this entire Psalms because in the Hebrew that he hath done this is the equivalent of John 1930, when in the Greek he would say, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. So these words were his last words. Sealing exactly as it should be. Strengthening the faith of Christianity, or it should. That he knew exactly not only what the good would be saying, but the very words that the false priest the so-called high priest appointed by a Roman general, the words that would come from his mouth on that day. And uh, so it was on that day that our Father brought forth this psalm that we could have this truth, that we could have this blessing, and it makes Holy Communion so very real and the words that he would state. Now, this is why it's important, beloved, that you remember concerning Holy Communion that the bread is his body. It was his body that received the stripes, as it is written. It is our bodies that receive the healing. Do you need some kind of help? Let him know as we partake of this Holy Communion, of this Passover. Christ has become our Passover. Again, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, that he was the one that was given in our stead that on repentance when you partake of these things. So always remember and know uh, it was his love for his children that has brought all these things to pass. It is his love for his children, his caring, that gives us a path forged by him through this wilderness we call this world whereby we can find that peace, whereby we can find that solace in his word and in his way. So at this time, I want you to take the ingredients that you have for on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is, is um, given to you. Take it and eat all of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for that body, that bread. He that took those stripes and we that get the healing. Thank you, Father. Thank you so very much for having given this way, this Passover, that gives us help, that gives us the victory. And it is real sad that much of the world in disbelief because of misteachings does not have the beauty of the high day of the high Sabbath of Christianity is to say that body, that bread that took the stripes and we that get the healing. Do you know something? As it is written in the great book of Isaiah, when he was delivered up and his body took those stripes, he didn't whimper didn't open his mouth. He did not say, let's wait another day. So that you can receive that healing.
so that you can receive that understanding. And, and with those stripes, we are healed. And I thank our Heavenly Father for that. Soon after, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that is shed for many. Take ye and drink ye all of it. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father, for the remission of sins. That through that Lamb of God, through your love for mankind, that we have that remission of sins and they're gone. And beloved, whatever you do, thank Him and let Him know that you appreciate that. As it is written, he could have, and we ask that in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. As it was written, he could have come in the body of angels, meaning supernatural. But he chose rather to come in a flesh body, just like ours. Hurts like ours when it is wounded offended when we are offended to show us that he would not ask you to do something that he would not do himself and yet show you how to do it with dignity and class that is to say to love and serve the living God and then on this to give us as in the beginning on Passover with our people in bondage. And that lamb was slain. And the instructions were put the blood of the lamb a sprinkle on the uh, on the doorpost. The lintel, so that the death angel would pass over. That's what Passover is about. And what became our Passover, Christ did, whereby the death angel must always pass over your family. That is, and by the death angel, we mean somebody that really has the ability to steal the souls of your loved ones, to turn them away into darkness. He gives you this light and this truth you have in him this perfection so from that night many many years ago when that lamb and that bread that was baked without leaven why it didn't have time to rise it's when it comes to the events that consummate the end of this age it happens quick that unleavened bread was made, which would be the body of Christ. And that body of Christ to this day, those that know and understand, escape the ways of this world through that high Sabbath that we call Passover, the Christian Passover. Well, and you know, many people are so ignorant, they don't realize that Passover is a Christian holiday. You find it a special day. I don't even feel comfortable calling it a holiday necessarily. But inasmuch as all of Passover, the lamb that was slain, was symbolic of the lamb of God that would come forever, give us forever, to give us eternal life. That we would have his word written a thousand years before the fact. And then, you know, you still have some people, well, how could we know the Bible is true? Do you think for one moment, man, 
could have written a document a thousand years before the fact and have all parties at a crucifixion opening their mouths and saying the very words that were presented. Uh, he trusted in God, let God deliver him and the Roman soldiers gambling for his Vesta. What do you think? That should strengthen your faith in the Word of God, for the Word of God is what delivers you. The Word of God gives you knowledge and wisdom and strength and comfort and brings forth the love and the fellowship that you share with and from Almighty God. What a precious thing. This, this having taken of this cup and having taken of this body, then, and with that repentance of all sins, know and understand that our Heavenly Father is with you. He will never leave you, nor will He forsake you. I just always add one thing, make sure that you do not forsake Him by turning away from him. He will allow you to do that. But when you see that schoolmaster of Passover, of that night many, many, many years ago, when they all gathered round and the blood of the Lamb caused that awful angel of death to pass over then let him pass over you yet today. And that that comes in, let it be the Spirit of Almighty God that he enters you in this Holy Communion. What a beautiful thing as we partake of that cup and that bread. Beloved, let your Father know that you appreciate him. Stay with him. Stay in him. Every day in him is a good day. You know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.